medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram lecture. Today we're going to talk about iodine and why countries are stockpiling it. That has to do with the fact that we may be having some nuclear fallout, either from a reactor or a nuclear weapon that gets deployed. And the problem is, is that there's going to be radiation associated with that. And we're going to talk about why iodine may be beneficial in just one area of radiation toxicity. So we're going to go back to our blackboard. I'm going to talk about the thyroid gland. Now, the thyroid gland has really just one purpose, and it's to make a substance called T4, which is later converted into T3. Just know that T3 is kind of like the oil that greases all of the processes of your body. So it's a really important organ. If you had no thyroid gland, you would die eventually. Some people who don't have good thyroid glands actually take supplementation and need to make sure that they're checking on that. But your thyroid gland needs iodine to make T4 and then T3. Iodine is extremely important. Basically, iodine gets incorporated into T4 and to T3. Where do you get iodine from? Iodine can get into your body several different ways. Obviously, food, but even air. And the iodine that we find in the regular environment is an isotope called iodine-127. Now, there are other types, but this is the major one. And this number up here is telling you how many particles, basically, of neutrons and protons are in the nucleus of the atom of iodine. The atomic number of iodine, which is the number of protons, is 53. And so you can have different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus of the iodine atom. And in this case, if you have 74, then you can see that it adds up to 127. This is basically what's going on every day in our lives. We take in iodine-127 into our thyroid gland. The thyroid gland then, as a factory, produces T4 and T3, which the body needs. If you have some sort of a nuclear event, and there's been a couple of these, unfortunately, that have happened. Japanese atomic bomb survivors... We also have the Marshall Islands, where the United States was testing nuclear ordinances and the people there were actually getting radiated. Probably the best well-known, where we were able to do medical science on what happened after that, is Chernobyl. That's a disaster that occurred in Ukraine in 1986. The Japanese atomic bomb released an amazing amount of radiation very quickly and then dissipated. Same with the Marshall Island. The thing that was different about Chernobyl is that it was a slow amount over a long period of time, which actually could be worse in terms of what we're about to talk about. These types of events make not iodine-127, but iodine-131, which is radioactive. It's still 53 protons, but instead of 74 neutrons, there are 78. Unfortunately, what happens with iodine-131 is that it gives off different types of radiation. One of them is gamma radiation, which is extremely high, powerful electromagnetic radiation. And the other one is beta particle, which is basically a negatively charged electron. But the problem is, is that when this gets incorporated into your thyroid gland, it destroys the tissue in the thyroid gland, and it alters the DNA, and it causes cancer. Specifically, it causes papillary thyroid cancer, otherwise known as PTC. We can measure this radiation, and it's measured in a unit called a gray, which is abbreviated as GY. So how much radiation potentially to get thyroid cancer? And they found that anywhere between 50 and 100 milligrays, that's also 0 0.050 grays. The problem here is that it can take anywhere from 5 to 10 years after the exposure to actually develop thyroid cancer. And it's particularly higher risk in people who are less than 20 years of age. This is not going to affect people who are older than 20 years as much as it is those that are less than 20. So we're looking at children who are exposed to high amounts of radiation, anything more than 50 to 100 milligrays of radiation. So they've done some research, and we'll put the link to the reference in the description below. And they looked at survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They recorded out of 105,000 people who were exposed, 371 thyroid cancers between 1958 and 2005. Generally speaking, the average person in the study was about 10 years of age when they were exposed, and they were able to look at them when they were about 50 years of age. And they found that the exposure increased the risk of thyroid cancer by 28%. They also found in the study that 36% of all the thyroid cancer was attributable to exposure before the age of 20, 
to radiation. There is an increase, it's not a massive increase, but realize that it's an increase that can be prevented. This 131 iodine goes everywhere. It goes into the air, the trees, the cows, their milk becomes radioactive. And so breathing in air, eating food products, all of these things are ways that iodine gets into your diet. The problem is it's the iodine-131 that's coming in. Well, the receptors for iodine-131 are identical to the receptors for iodine-127, which is the normal iodine. And so what we do here is basically a competition to exclude iodine-131 from coming into the thyroid gland. So if you take high doses of iodine-127, you can effectively block out and prevent iodine-131 from going into the thyroid gland. If you take potassium iodide, it's not going to prevent you from other types of radiation exposure. It will only prevent the issues with radiation exposure to the thyroid gland. You can't go out and get the iodine tablets after the radiation exposure because you have to do it at the same time or even before so that the iodine-131 doesn't come in and get taken up by the thyroid gland. Now let's go over some practical information for how you can acquire and know how to dose and what to do with iodine tablets. First question is going to be, how do I get them? So the good news is you don't need a prescription to purchase potassium iodide tablets. It's not a controlled substance. You can actually buy it as a nutritional supplement. But what I would recommend is digging a little bit deeper, and I don't endorse any of these particular brands, but let's see, we can click on one here, and we'll see here's a three-pack. They come in different milligram dosages, like this one's 130 milligrams. There's also a 65 milligram version that you can buy, and we'll talk about the dosing in a little bit. You can ask questions and see whether or not the company and the factory that it's made at is FDA approved, and whether or not it's been verified by a third party. How much do I take? So this is a great website put out by New York State, Potassium Iodine and Radiation Emergencies. They have nuclear power plants in New York State, and so they actually have a rule that anybody that's within 5 or 10 miles of a nuclear power plant should have potassium iodide tablets on hand. Perhaps some of you listening can tell us a little bit more about what they've told you. Here's a great FAQ, and here's the table you should look at, and it's how much potassium iodide do I take? And so for birth to one month of age, they have the potassium iodide dosing, the number of milliliters of liquid, the number of 65 milligram tablets if you have them, and the number of 130 milligram tablets if you have those. And they have it here for each one of the ages. Now we said that over the age of 20, the chances of getting thyroid cancer from radiation exposure is pretty low. It's pretty minimal. But if you want to protect yourself, that is an option that you can do. When should I start taking it? What's going to happen is there's going to be an announcement from the public health department or some local authority that's going to say, you need to start taking your potassium iodide. And if you don't have it in your home, then obviously you're going to have to go out and get it. And there's going to be a big surge to get that at that time. So it's good to make sure that you have it on hand to begin with. But the short answer to this is that they will tell you when to start taking it because the authorities actually have ways of measuring continuously the amount of radiation in the air. There's no harm in taking it beforehand, other than the risks of taking the medication, which we'll talk about. But there is a risk if you take it too late, because if you start to absorb too much I-131 before you can block it with the oral tablets, then obviously I-131 is going to go into your system. For example, you can see what the wind did to the radiation from Chernobyl back in 1986 and how it spread across Europe. This happened within hours to days to weeks. By the way, the radiation here was in the level of thousands of milligrays, so well above the 50 milligrays that would increase the risk. How long should I take it for? Well, again, the officials monitoring the radiation in the air will let you know when those have gone down to safe levels and you don't have to take potassium iodide tablets. This could last for weeks, maybe even a month or so. And this is the reason countries are stockpiling potassium iodide. It's very cheap to make, very easy. But if there's a big demand for it, it might be difficult to get. Next question is, are there risks of taking potassium iodide? Well, if there were big risks, they probably wouldn't make it available over the counter. But are there risks of taking potassium iodide? Back to this New York State Health Department website on the topic. And they say here that in general, most people who have taken potassium iodide have not had any reactions or side effects. If people did have a reaction, it did not last very long. In a few cases, babies had a reaction in their thyroids. 
adults who had reactions and stomach problems or a rash. The federal government thinks the benefits of taking potassium iodide are much greater than the risks. That would, of course, be during a nuclear incident. The corollary is question number nine. Are there some people who should not take potassium iodide? They say most people can take it, but you should talk to your doctor before taking it. Let me just tell you as a physician, if you have a thyroid condition, you may want to talk to your doctor about this, especially if you're under the age of 20 because you're at most risk for getting thyroid cancer from radiation exposure. But there are hyperthyroid conditions that if you were to give high doses of potassium iodide could actually flare up the hyperthyroid state. An example of that would be a Graves disease. It's possible that if you took a lot of potassium iodide, that could flare up your hyperthyroidism. So it's important to talk to your doctor about whether or not iodine is the right thing to do. There are some people that are allergic to seafood. And there is a correlation and a connection between seafood allergies and iodine allergies as well, at least in the realm of getting iodinated contrasts in the hospital. Can KI be purchased at local pharmacies? And they say here, yes, though it may not widely be available in drugstores near you. Since it is not a prescription drug, you can buy it over the internet. As with other drugs, make sure that the potassium iodide you buy has been approved by the FDA. A supply of potassium iodide has been made available to people who live within 10 miles of a nuclear power plant in the New York State area. If you live within 10 miles of a nuclear power plant and did not receive potassium iodide, contact your local office of emergency management. I'll put a couple of links to some great review articles like this one called Radiation Exposure and Thyroid Cancer, a review. And also this article titled Radiation Exposure to the Thyroid After the Chernobyl Accident. Well, I hope this has been helpful to you and highlighted some things that you may not have known. Thanks for joining us.